geographers to carry on with this lecture on geography and more, more of us you know, getting to know what geography is all about. But now we're going to get into uh, more into Steve's book, the first chapter of introduction, introducing the human geography. Uh, Steve's book, you know, chapter one. Um, all right, so throughout the book, I'm assuming you guys have read it, you know, this first chapter, like the good college students that you are, um, in there, he gets, he gets into this uh, Star Wars stuff, all right, you notice that, the uh, little Yodas, uh, and all that all over the place, I'm gonna point out what, what he's doing, uh, with this, but the whole, the whole approach is this, uh, it's Star Wars stuff, it's the idea that Geographers are, uh, you know, like Jedi or, or whatever. We do some cool stuff. Um, I'm not going to force that uh, nerdy stuff upon you, but uh, I can't argue uh, that we're special uh, in, you know, well, you've already seen it. All right, so when you see Yoda in his, his sunglasses there, Steve refers to this as Jedi goggles, meaning, in fact, to quote, the man, I uh, think geographers have a way of doing things that are unique and exceptionally powerful. I can't argue uh, with that at all. But what, he, what he's getting into with the whole Yoda stuff here is, is really this idea of reading the landscape, of which I've spoken a little previously, but it's that idea of being able to look at just the stuff in front of us, whether we're inside or outside or whatever, but we can look at these things and we can we can put stuff together. We get that context that I've been talking about, right? We get a sense of not just what's happening, but where it's happening, and that can help explain the why it's happening and all that. So whenever you're reading through his chapters, you see Yoda in the corner there. It's it's pointing out the, something about being able to look at the landscape read the landscape okay so it's it's uh you know again reading the landscape means we're looking at the built environment or the altered environment we're looking at how humans have affected nature whether in a you know an obvious way like you're looking at a, the downtown of a city or you're looking at a national park which is natural but it's also it's still not you know 100 percent human free right because we made a park and we have roads going in there and campsites and trails and things like that uh so that's that's what we're looking at stuff that humans have done and we're looking at everything right that's the the key thing like we're not just looking at one pretty building over here one you know scenic view over here or whatever we want to look at everything uh i, I took this picture um because i think it kind of it 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 shows what we should be trying to do not even just as geographers but if you really truly want to think critically i think this picture sums it up where you've got the flowers planted right the roses are planted there specifically to look pretty and smell nice and all that. And you might, if you're not, you know, a trained geographer, Jedi or otherwise, you might just look at the flowers and you see that and you're like, oh, what nice flowers. And you walk on in your ignorance, right? But if you really are looking and you look past these things, these pretty things, the pretty decoration, you see what's really going on. You've got the dumpsters back there, the service entrance thing right where a truck can back up in there either to grab the trash and dump it or to bring deliveries or or whatever you, you get a, a sense of what's going on behind the scenes and so that's what we're looking at we want to look at the pretty and that's important to see but we also want to look and see what else is there right or what are the things we're not meant to see uh, whether it's a deliberate you know, conspiracy, some kind of masking thing, or we're just not meant to see because, you know, people just didn't think it looked nice or, or whatever. Right? It doesn't always have to be an evil conspiracy, but still, 
what what are we supposed to look at? What aren't we supposed to look at? And what happens when we look at that stuff, right? That's the the idea there. Now another thing, I'm not I'm not going to dwell um, on this stuff too much, but it's it's not just like in you know a little scene like our our flowers and dumpsters and all that, but in looking at actual cities or, or bigger areas, you can get a sense of what's going on. Um, yeah, I, I, you, uh, you want to learn about the state geography one on one. I talk about our squares uh, in there. We're not, you know what? We're not even going to bother with it. I got better stuff to talk about, and, and I'm tired. Um, so forget that. Oh, and then, okay. And then there's, okay, so with this, folk architecture. Steve loves folk architecture, and it's, uh, it's adorable. Um, and I know, because he was my professor, I, I know what these things are. I had the shotgun and the dog trot and the salt box and, and all this stuff, because I had to learn it. Um... Don't worry about this stuff. It's it's interesting. I'm not going to test you on any of the folk architecture stuff, so don't even worry about it. Um, these are some links I would share if we were in class, but we're not, so I'm not going to. But there's stuff like the walking in L.A. I want, as a guy who walks around L.A., and he takes pictures of stuff, he maps it, you know, and it's the most like mundane, seemingly boring thing ever um but it's also it's fascinating in just what it does and what it is and this little this archive of los angeles and what it looks like and and so on that's that's something we do it doesn't have to be full-on super nerdy you don't have to like looking at old buildings or or stuff like that or whatever but it's just that idea of going out and looking at stuff and trying to figure out what's going on with it right that's it's a big part of geography, all right? So that's that's the whole Yoda deal. And you got Obi Wan uh, here, which Steve refers to as whenever you see this image here, it's the whole Jedi mind trick idea. And this is really it's uh, this is epistemology. This is getting into how we know what we know about the world around us. And Steve is arguing that we geographers. Yeah, you know, and and really, regardless of whether you're a positivist or not, or you know what approach you take, uh, we we just we just got ways of knowing stuff that other folks don't. Like, no offense, sociologists or political scientists or whatever. Bless your hearts, you're trying, um, uh, but you're not this cool, right? You're just not this cool. And he he gives an example of like looking at. Um, uh, racial differences in the students who use the elevator versus the stairs. And, you know, you see stuff like that. You see a difference between, you know, black folks do this and white folks do that. We, we kind of default toward like there's, well, it's because these people are, are of African descent and these people are of European descent. Like we try to make it about race when it really isn't. That's just this visible Thing. And you can you can read Steve's um, discussion of this thing in the chapter, but it is it's the idea, and this is what I'm going to be trying to share with you guys a lot. Is there's that stuff that seems obvious, it seems natural or like common sense. If you think back to like Gramsci and hegemony and all that, right? Whenever something seems natural. We want to worry. We want to. We want to panic a little bit. And we want to question, and we want to say, uh, "Is it right?" And and that's that's what what this is. And that's again, that's what we're going to be training you to do. And and then we got lightsabers uh, here, where basically we got cool stuff that that we get to use. And we're not going to be using laser swords in the class. I mean, if we were in class, yes, I would I would pull these things out and we would fight each other. Obviously, um, but we're not, so no laser swords for you. Um, but what he's getting into is that we have we have some cool stuff, toys uh, that we get to play with. Um, and, and one of the big things that he brings up, and we'll we'll see, is this uh, uh, thing called GIS or Geographic Information Systems. 
which is, it's a way of mapping. It's a terrible name. I'm not going to lie. I've always hated it. Uh, I started learning GIS. It's going, it was like 20 years ago when I, I started learning this stuff. Um, and, I, you know, that was like cutting edge back then. And it's still amazing what you can do with this stuff. But I always hated the name because it just sounds so clinical and all doesn't have a good name. But it's, it's, it's mapping with computers and, and database technology and remote sensing and all sorts of, of cool stuff. But what you can do, and this kind of goes back to like the Jedi mind trick thing, is you can, you can map this stuff out and you can ask a few questions and you can do a few things and you can see things that other people can't see. And you can help other people see this stuff. There is nothing cooler than making a map and, and deriving information from it and showing it to people and having them have their minds blown. Um, it's fantastic. It's fantastic stuff. And we'll, we'll get into, I'll spend a day talking about mapping and what GIS is and, and kind of more old school cartography and, and that kind of stuff. So I'll cover some of these, these tools that we have. But one thing, just I'll, I'll get into, um, I'm sure, so, you know, spoiler alert, but I'll, I'll tell you now. One of the great things is the whole GIS deal, you can get, you can get a job if you actually, you know, learn stuff like this. If you learn some kind of tool that is useful. One thing I'm sure I'll be talking in more depth about later on is the whole idea how we talk about, uh, you know, just get, oh, just go get that degree and you're set, right? That's what, you know, everybody, like when you're in high school, everybody's hyping the whole college thing. Oh, you got to do college. Oh, college is the best. And you get to a place like ABC and you talk to the counselors and you go to the orientation. It's like, oh, college, you do, you get the college degree and you're going to be set. No, no, we are lying to you. Are you aware of that? Yeah, nobody tells you that we're lying to you until you're, until you're stuck, until we hooked you, until you're, you know, in college long enough and you've, you've already invested the time, maybe you got a few loans out and all that, and you got to stick with it. Yeah, we're lying big time. And that, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm you know, so college is the greatest thing in the world. You should all be here. You should all be taking these classes, working toward degrees, Every single one of you should at least get a master's, if that's what you want. If it's right for you, I mean, don't waste your time. Don't and don't get into debt and all that if you don't need to. But yeah, shoot for a master's degree at least. And by the way, anybody can get a master's degree. It intimidated the hell out of me when I started. I didn't even know anybody who had a master's degree uh, or anything like that. It, it seemed like that's what you know, brilliant people get. No, um, no, no, it's not, you don't have to be brilliant. I'll tell you that much. I have one. I met a few people. Um, no, but it's, it's just, it's, you know, it's perseverance. It's just wanting to do it. And actually the master's is easier because you're, you're excited about what you're learning. You, you know, you're just taking classes in the subject you love. So it should be no problem. But that said, I just I just said how like you know you have a college degree, you're going to be set, you're going to get the job, and I, I call bullshit on that. Um, you're probably wondering, yeah, get back to that. Yeah, here's the deal: get a degree. That's fantastic. That's that's useful. But if you don't get a degree in something that someone wants to, you know, hire you to do that stuff with, um, you're out of luck, right? And I learned that the hard way. Got a, a bachelor's degree. Uh, from UCLA, of all places. I don't know if you heard about that school, but it's impressive. And I had all sorts of people telling me, like, oh, don't worry, you get that degree, you're going to be set. Nope. Nope. Because, you know, I had some skills. I could write a mean research paper and, and all that, but uh, yeah, nobody wanted to hire me before that. I actually went back to a community college to learn GIS to help augment my degree in the career path I had and, and all that stuff. And once I did that, I, I actually started getting job. I put GIS on my resume and it was, it was instant. It was amazing. People were suddenly interested in me and, and I got hired. And, and once that, like everything just 
fell into place right there. But it was only because I learned a useful tool, right? I had that lightsaber um, that, that I could sell to people, right? I was not just selling my labor, but I had skilled labor I could sell to employers. That's what you need. Okay, so and I'll, I'll talk about this more. Like we're gonna watch a movie. We're gonna we're gonna cover some of this stuff uh, in in a few weeks here. Um, but I do want to stress that that you need to have more than just that basic degree. You can't just do the bare minimum and expect to get hired onto a place because that's what everybody's doing. Think about how many people are going to college, graduating every single year. And all that. If you want to stand out, you need to have some kind of skill, right? And GIS is a fantastic skill to have. Maybe not for everybody, um, but but if you like it, go with it. Uh, and if you don't like that one, find something else that works. And it doesn't mean you have to switch your major to be a geographer, although you should. Um, but anybody can use this stuff. You can be, you know, business or administration of justice or sociology or whatever it might be, you can utilize something like GIS. Enough about that. I'll get into this. This is embarrassing. I'm talking too much about, you know, how great, this, how it will, this will, will make your life wonderful. You'll never know sorrow again if you learn it. Um, you know, but what do I know? I'm just an old man talking to himself at his desk. Um, all right, let's move on. So that's that one. Uh, then it gets into, we got the Death Star. Um, which he refers to as Jedi language. I think he just ran out of, you know, clever ways to connect it. So he put the big, uh, what, planet-destroying laser moon, uh, whatever it is. Um, but this is the idea of we're not, it's the idea of, like, if you're literate, you can read words. Um, you know, we, we know that. And, and to be able to read numbers, to think mathematically, right, numeracy, that's another way of doing it. Um, and that's kind of like we, we train our students to know they have like the verbal and the quantitative skills, right? That's what you've tested for with state testing and the SATs and the ACTs and, and all that. That's what we focus on. Now, graphicacy, so you being able to read images, that's something we don't train people on at all. And that's what we'll be doing and that's what I've already done. You've looked at toilet pictures. I mean, that's a, a big part of geography, I feel, is to be able to look at a toilet and, and say something um, about what's going on. So that's the graphicacy idea. And then Steve takes it even further, and he gets into cartographicacy, which is the ability to read maps, to do some spatial analysis, to be able to look at where this is and where that is and what's, you know, what's there and what's not there and, and see what these relationships are across space, right? Between different places, that kind of stuff. So we'll we'll get into that. All right, so that's what these little Star Wars things are throughout there, and they're, they're at the different chapters, and they're useful to kind of just bring your attention to what's going on, all right? And, and it's, it's, it's fun for you nerds um, as well, to feel like Jedi warriors uh, as, as you're learning about geography. So... Enjoy. All right, now let's get into this. Is some of the good stuff. These are the core concepts, according to Dr. Graves. Um, and this is every human geography, cultural geography textbook. You know, has some kind of five themes or, or whatever, um, and they they vary across the books. Typically, they're pretty similar. Um, but Steve, he, he actually made some that I think are unique, or they get more unique as we move down and more relevant to geography itself. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I, I like the guy and I'm trying to suck up to him or anything like that. Like I think actually he, he gets into stuff that's, that's quite useful as we move down the list here. So we've got location, region, diffusion, process and pattern, and then co location. And honestly, the first three, pretty standard, but the ones as we go on, uh, we'll, we'll, look, we'll get to it. All right, we'll, we'll get to it. So let's just jump in here. I'm going to go with number one, 
location. And so location, you know, it's where you are, right? We've got the, the idea of, of absolute location as being an address, right? Like a, a fixed location where you are. I am sitting at my desk, uh, you know, in my home, in an undisclosed location in the greater Antelope Valley. Um, you know, that's my location right there. This image, that is our, our dear friend, Steve Graves, uh, here in this line that he's straddling is the prime meridian, um, which is the, the zero line of longitude. So it's an absolute location. It's an important one for referencing with, you know, maps. It's, it's a nerdy geography picture, um, you know, that, that he, he has uh, right there. How could you not have that photo taken if you're a geographer in England standing right there, right? So, but that's a, a fixed place. So that's, that's what he's getting at with location, right? And knowing locations, just that, that simple fact of where stuff is, that's important. And we'll, we'll look at it and we'll, we'll get into why that's, that's important and why certain locations are more important for this thing than that thing and, and so on. Just being able to locate something on a map, that's key. So we're gonna, we'll, we'll see that, obviously, in this class. Then another thing that's key is how everything in the modern world is getting more and more connected to location, right? As, as our phones get smarter, uh, a huge component of how smartphones work is the fact that they have a GPS receiver built in. All right, so the global positioning system, which is a constellation of satellites up in the sky. We got like 24 of them, um, I think total, or well, I forget the exact number, but there are a bunch up there in space. And our, you know, our phones, or if we have a separate GPS receiver, you know, just unit itself, or a, a fancy watch, or a thing in our car, or whatever it might be, it's reading stuff from these satellites and using that to figure out where it is and you know that's how that works. That's how your phone knows where you are. And now we can use the the mapping apps and uh, software and, and all that stuff, right? And then actually that that mapping, it's actually GIS. So when we ask our phone, say, hey phone, I'm right here, but I want to go to this place. I want to there's this, this hip new restaurant I want to go check out. Phone, where is it? And the phone says, okay, we're well, here. We'll go over here and then, then turn right and then turn left here. And then you're going to want to hang a U-turn and then boom, you're at this new place, right? How does the phone do it? It's GIS. It's all, it's computer mapping and database stuff and a pretty simple, you know, example of GIS, but an incredibly useful one and important one for just life in general. Right, and this is one of the reasons why you can get a job if you know GIS is because we're so dependent on these apps that use it to, you know, get us from point A to point B or to figure out whatever. Right, take your pick. Pretty much any any time you open up an app on your phone and it asks, you know, for the first time, and your phone asks you like, "This app wants to know your location. Are you cool with that?" And you're like, "Sure, whatever. Like, what? Who's gonna track me?" Right. Anytime it wants to know your location, there's something GIS-y going on, right? So, I mean, think about that in terms of jobs and work and, and opportunity. Um, so that's, that's what we got going on. Although one thing that's really important to be aware of is the fact that all of this, it, it seems pretty simple how all of this stuff works. Like our phone just knows, and I mean, maps, is, you know, it's free, and I'm, I just hit a few colorful buttons, and everything seems to work, and, and it seems cool. There's actually a lot going on, you know, underneath the screen. There, there are a lot of algorithms at work and things to, to make it seem simple. But I found over the years that, unfortunately, we've made it so simple, which is great. I've got to feel good about that. Um, but at the same time, when you start to try to use it on your own and kind of go beyond just what the map, the app is, is telling you and all that, you can get into trouble. One thing is, is, you know, location isn't 
as simple as it might seem. All locations aren't equal, all right? Uh, one concept that I'm not going to dwell on in here, but if this really gets you excited, uh, sign up for Geography 201 in the spring. I'll, I'll spend some time talking about datums and, and GPS and, and all that. It's a, like a mapping, field mapping and digital mapping course. Take it. It's fun. We hike all over campus and we go have adventures out in uh, the desert uh, and all that. So sign up for that one. If, if all this, this nerdy location stuff is getting you excited or if you just want to walk around in the desert with me. Um, but, uh, but with this, this datum idea, it's like an origin point. Uh, so any map that exists, whether it's a piece of paper, data stored in your phone or whatever, it's based uh, off of a datum. One of these origin points. But we got a lot of these things. Our, our cell phones default to this WGS, WGS 1984 World Geodetic System in there, which is great and it works. But a lot of government maps, um, they're U.S. government, I should say, were produced either with a North American datum of 1927 or the updated North American datum of 1983. And what this image is showing, we've got the blue line and the red line on there, and they're, you know, same shape, but they're offset there. Um, that's what happens when, say, I use my phone to give me some coordinates based on what the GPS is telling me, and then I try to map it on a map that wasn't mapped with that WGS 84 datum. Right, where you can you can think you're being accurate and and uh, sciency as, as hell with the thing, but the reality is you don't ultimately know what you're doing, and you can make horrible horrible mistakes. When I worked before I was a professor, and I, I worked um, in in industry doing you know different mapping things, I had a few times where people wanted to sue, not me specifically. Um, but, you know, the, the agency I worked for or whatever because they, you know, use some of our maps and they use it for like a real estate deal, uh, thinking they were going to get rich quick. And then it turns out, nope, they were wrong and they wanted, you know, to sue us because they wasted thousands of dollars. Um, and, you know, and our response is, you don't understand. <laughs> you don't understand geography. I'm sorry. Um, no one told you to do this. And we, of course, had a disclaimer that said, like, make sure you know geography um, before you spend thousands of dollars on Worthless land or whatever. But that's the, that's the key thing with location. It seems simple, but it's not. There's a lot to learn. And like I said, I'm not, we're not going to dwell on this, this nerdy geodesy stuff um, so much in here because we got, you know, stuff to talk about. Toilets and drugs and, and, and things like that, like we've been doing in, in this class. Um, that's what we're going to talk about. But I just bring this up as kind of a warning. All right, that's the location. Now, the second core concept is that of regions and so a region is just it's an area where you've got multiple locations within this area that are very similar in either physical or cultural traits right we'll have plenty of examples of this but you can think of like the antelope valley as a region right it's made up of, of cities, such unique cities like Palmdale and Lancaster. It's, it's the same place, right? I, there's, there's no difference between these, these cities, honestly, except for the spelling of the, the name. We should blend them together. We would save bazillions of dollars uh, in terms of, you know, government uh, spending and the tax revenue would all go to one place. Oh, it'd be great, but we don't do it. Um, because there's this like sibling rivalry between the two cities. It's it's really we'll we'll talk more about that later too. Um, but yeah, it's like the region of the Antelope Valley. It's a bunch of places, you know. And it's not just Palmdale and Lancaster. We've got you know Quartz Hill. That's that's very different, right? Um, you know, and and Antelope Acres and Lake LA and Little Rock. Like wh however far you want to go with this stuff, um, there. They're similar places. It's much easier to speak of the Antelope Valley, and it's much easier to study the Antelope Valley rather than study Palmdale 
and then Lancaster, and then Quartz Hill, and then Lake LA, and then Pear Blossom, and you know, blah, 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 right? That's what we're doing with regions. We're lumping stuff together because in many cases, it's easier to study stuff in that way. We can kind of get the big picture when we do that. Okay? But, but we have different regions. We have different types of regions. So we have these three types. And I, Lord knows, I don't want to just give everything away. I like to keep this very sneaky and, and subtle, you know, to make my students squirm when they have to take a quiz or a test or, or whatever. Um, can I be honest with you? Some of these, these things so easy to write test questions on, right? Um, like, like with this region stuff, it's pretty straightforward definitions, you know, a functional region is, and a formal region is, and I'll define what a vernacular region is. No, these definitions. Um, if, if not for your, you know, first quiz, you've got a midterm, you, these will be useful to know. Um, yeah. All right. So let's, let's get in to what these things are. A functional region. This is something that has been mapped out, drawn. It's intentional. It's something political or economic. Sometimes it's a social thing. Um, but it's, it's stuff like, well, we got, you know, the state of Tennessee. When I picked because it simply fit the slide well, because it's this horizontal flat. It kind of looks like it was squished. No offense, Tennessee. Um, but yeah, you, you have this intentional boundary, right? And you know if you're in Tennessee or not, right? And you can cross. You can drive, you know, north from Nashville and cross the border and so you're in Tennessee, and then you leave it, and then boom, you're in Kentucky, right? We know where that is. We have these very clean, precise lines. So that's what we mean when we're talking about a functional culture region, all right? And within these, here, this is just kind of geography speak in here, but a node refers to some important location within that functional culture region, okay? A city hall, right? Or, you know, a capital city or, or national capital itself or whatever. Some, you know, a place where decisions are made. And quite often a place where power is held. It goes back to this core periphery idea. I think I mentioned earlier in a previous uh, thing, but the idea that that node would represent the core, it's where the, the power is, right? So think of, you know, the, the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. It's where decisions are made. It's where power is, is held and used and, and all that. And then as you move further away from that node, you're going into the periphery and you can see that power dissipate, right? Not everybody has all the power. And it's not necessarily that simple, because you could argue um, that like we here in Southern California, we're far away from Washington, D.C., which we, you know, say is the node for the functional culture region of the United States of America. But Southern California, we got some power down here, right? We have some uh, very wealthy people who are very influential, and you, you know, you can move up the state uh, as well to Silicon Valley, you know, you can't say that a guy like Mark Zuckerberg doesn't have power, right? Uh, you know, Elon Musk, like whatever, Jeff Bezos, like take whatever, I mean, he has a house in D.C., but you get what I'm saying, right? Yeah, I think he mainly lives in Seattle. I, mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't keep track of my billionaires. Um, but so you can say, you know, it's not a perfect model where the node is the only place in there. It can be a little more spiderwebby, but still... It's interesting to study within these functional culture regions, you know, where is that core, where is that periphery, how does that play out, all right? It's also good to know that even though we can map these things, sometimes they can just be weird, seemingly arbitrary, um, but again, we don't want to think about that as it being natural or whatever. There's a history, there's a material history behind it. So like looking at the zip codes uh, in here, we've got like this one. I don't know where this is. I, I just grabbed it from Google. But I love stuff 
because you have you know like this oh good old old seven eight seven five seven um that, that just looks normal and like a nice little shape right here but what the hell is going on with this guy seven eight six one seven that's ridiculous it's got these little like snail antennae or whatever going this way who knows who i don't like i said i just stole this but you can look at it and you could say you know that might be because of some kind of clear physical boundaries it you know there's a you know big mountain range here so it separates these guys from these guys over here but there's a little valley maybe um it could also be that you know whoever lives here by God, was in a blood feud with the people over here, and I'll be damned if this this mail carrier from over here gives me the mail. I mean, it can be that stupid. I've met people who get that crazy about addresses um, in the past. So some of these things can be, like the shapes themselves can be kind of weird. They might have an interesting history behind them, but still, we we you know we want to uh, we want to study that. We want to get into why it is what made this functional culture region in the first place and we'll like we'll talk about political geographies and the political map like why the states are the way you know shaped the way they are and that kind of stuff all right we'll we'll get to that all right now a formal culture region so this is their second type here this is one where it's just the people within it they share some kind of cultural trait and it could be one or more right so a language that is spoken right? a particular economic practice or industry or something like that religious beliefs whatever it might be it's it's shared by people in an area but here's the deal in contrast to that functional culture region a formal culture region is a messy messy thing right one of my favorite words to use when I'm talking about humans uh, in general because we're a messy species but it's the kind of deal where we don't have these clean border lines we have zones we have weird transitional areas right language is an easy way to think about that like do we have if we look at the United States Mexican border right that line separating the two countries that would be a functional culture region of the US of Mexico right so we've got that functional region but let's think about you know English and Spanish as languages do we only have Spanish speakers on the you know south of that border and only English spe speakers north of that border of course not right and it would be really hard to map where that line really is it would be impossible to do that it's 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 messy right it's a messy thing so that's what we're dealing with when we're dealing with formal culture regions uh steve in the book points out uh mormons the the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints you know the core region in, in here would be around utah right where the headquarters of the church is actually located you know and there's a history behind that and so on and so if we look at this map this is called a choropleth map where we've got uh i think yeah it looks like counties who have got mapped out here um so we've got you know counties across the u.s mapped those functional lines but we're using this formal culture region data pract uh, practitioners of the lds uh, uh church um we're mapping that within these uh, uh county borders Right, and so it's it shows the the red, the dark red there, is a lot. You got a lot of Mormons in there, and the orange is well, it's not as much as the red, but you got a you got a healthy number of Mormons in that. And then yellow a little less, um, and you know green less, and and so on. Right, uh, and you can see, I mean, you don't have this perfectly neat, clean, functional type region. Like it's not just Utah is red. And everything else is white. Um, you know, that's that doesn't uh, exist because people move and we don't, you know, behave like robots or computer programs or whatever. And what's also crazy, so the whole core periphery idea, um, yeah, we've got this this core right here. And as you know, in the general western states, you kind of see that. I mean, you got some interesting stuff where it's just, you know, white with the idea of no 
presence in here. Some of that has to do with like, you know, Indian reservations and the other the reasons for that in the area that, you know, tie in with, with other functional boundaries. But then what's what's kind of cool is just that it's not this this perfect core periphery thing. Like Maine, you got a bunch of Mormons up here, right? Just hanging out. Not quite, you know, this much, but but more than say down here. Why is that? I don't know. I haven't I haven't studied it. Um but but you could if you were interested, right? And that's this is also it goes to show how mapping, even though mapping formal regions like this can be difficult and you have to kind of be creative in order to do it. Just the act of mapping can be a useful thing when you're studying whatever, right? You don't you don't need to be excited about like oh, I want to map some Mormons. Um, yeah, maybe that. In fact, don't don't do that. That's kind of creepy, to be perfectly honest with you. That that's, that's don't don't start mapping people. Um, I like that way, it's, it sounds very Nazi-ish. Um, but still, maybe you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, mapping something like this. Hell, I'll show you way more ridiculous maps uh, in, in future classes. Um, but, but still, just being able to map whatever it is you want to study, incredibly useful, incredibly powerful thing. All right? Um, all right, there's that, again, that corporate. I already talked about this. I don't know why this slide should be up sooner. Oh, there you go. I talked about it. All right, let's move on. Uh, and this is just showing, again, this is messy. Oh, let's move on. We got other stuff. Oh, here we go. Yeah, we don't want to dwell on that. We want to get to my favorite culture region, the vernacular culture region. And I love these because they're imaginary. They're perceived to exist by individuals, whether people living within them or who just know about them or whatever. That's, that's fantastic stuff. Uh, things like, so examples here, we've got Dixie. Y'all know what Dixie is? Do you? That's kind of miss being in the classroom. This is when it's fun. Cause you know, some people I'll say, what's Dixie? And like one or two people might say like the South. Uh, and I shout at them, it's, no, it's not the South, right? It's the South. And you gotta like shoot your guns in the air and go, yeehaw. And you know, it's like, it's like the Confederacy, right? It's, it's, uh, it's the losing team from the Civil War. That's what Dixie is really getting into. Um, so it's the idea of, you know, when we say the South, what does that mean? Can we draw a map of the South? How does that, eh, how does that work, right? And same kind of deal, like it's, it's you know, a lot of the, the regions of the United States fit into this, you know, Dixie, one of the South, New England, the Midwest, Southern versus Northern California, we'll talk about that one. They're perceived as, like, we all know, like, yeah, of course, yeah, we got the Midwest, yeah, that's a thing, but we can't actually map it, right? Or you could say, okay, map it, and, and you could say that to, like, five different people, and five different people would give you five different maps, because we don't have perfect borders, but we know in our minds that these things exist, right? So Dixie, the idea of the South. This is a great map. Um, and this was, I think it might have been Zelensky who, who did this um, with his cultural history of the U.S. or, or whatever. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. An old, an old geographer uh, did this, and he used a telephone book telephone books from around the area to get a sense of where Dixie was. And I don't know, I realize I might have, I, do you guys know what a telephone book is? You know what I, when I say phone book, then the map here says telephone directory. It's a phone book. I still get them uh, at my house and I immediately recycle them. Um, Cause who needs it when you got Google? But, but kids, listen, there was a time when there was no Google. Right? And it wasn't like, we just used, you know, Yahoo or, or whatever. No, I mean, we didn't have the internet or search engines or whatever. You had instead a giant book with every phone number in there. Right? So if you needed to look up a friend's phone number, you found their name. You looked them up in, in the phone book. Um, or if you needed to find a business, you go to Yellow Pages and you look up Blummers or whatever it might be. Okay? So what this guy did with the map was he looked at all these phone books from around 
the greater southern region. And he looked at like businesses, like you know, plumbers or, or whatever, uh, and looked to see how many times they refer to themselves as, you know, Dixie plumbing or plumbers or whatever, or American plumbers, right? Did they identify as being Southern or American first, right? So they so he looked for all this stuff and mapped it out. And so the blue in here, which is labeled as the heart of Dixie, that's where it's uh, uh, that's where everybody's identifying as Dixie, as being Southern, as being Confederate, or you know whatever. Right? And by the way, this map was like from the seventies. You know, not the 1870s, the, the 1970s. I mean, we're seeing that, right? We're, we're still fighting over statues of, of the losing team. Um, you know, the, the guys that, that our country wasn't happy with, uh, we're still fighting uh, over this stuff. But you can see, you know, it's been alive and well in this area. So the blue is, is you know, the, again, that heart of Dixon and the green. It's, it's still prevalent, but not quite as much. And then it goes down to that, you know, kind of orangish, reddish, whatever color uh, in there. And then the yellowish color, it starts to fade, right? And you see these lines, they don't match up with the functional state lines. And you can also see what's cool, the little, the little islands, the cities in there, right? Atlanta or Charlotte or Miami or whatever. You've got these, these islands of difference. And it kind of, you know, depends on, on where you are, what that difference actually means. Are they more Southern or less Southern? Uh, and, you know, that you can speculate all you want, and that could lead to more studies about what's going on there. But that's, you know, vernacular. We know it exists, but we can't really say where it is, right, or where those, those lines are. Northern California, Southern California. This is, if we were in class right now, we would be yelling at each other about where these goddamn lines are, right? What does it mean to be Southern Californian or Northern Californian? And we would argue and, and fight, um, you know, and I'd ask about stuff like Bakersfield and say, are they Northern California or Southern California? Nobody would really know. And one, one smart ass in the back would say, well, isn't that Central California? And I'd say, shut up, because that's cheating. Where it's either Northern or Southern. Nobody really says Central. Um, and then, you know, we'd find, I'd, I'd, like, I'd fight to get uh, Bakersfield to be made Southern California. Because I'm from Northern California, and I don't, I don't want, want it. Um, even though I'm more Southern California now, I've been here for a while. Um, but, and I was in, nothing, nothing against Bakersfield, if you're from there. I, I live there. I don't even say I live. I said I was exiled there for like three years. Um, got a job. Don't do it. Uh, we'll, we'll probably talk more about that too. Anyway, so we fight about this. But the point is, we don't really even know. Um, you know what? Where it is? It, it's a. It's messy, right? It's a messy thing, uh, and and so that's that's another thing to think about. I even googled it to try to find maps, and I found these. And what I love about it uh, is there's a big chunk of California kind of cut out if you really put these maps back together, because it's like the whole Central California idea or Eastern California. Nobody cares. Right? Like, I, I, you know, will admit to you, I didn't even know you guys existed until I was forced um, off the five uh, because of a fire many years ago and, and got onto the 138. Didn't even know that existed. Right? And I was pushed out um, on a detour over to the 14, and, and, there were the, and there were people who lived out. In this place, this, this this city or town or what it seemed small, but I guess it's a city, Lancaster and and Palmdale and interesting, no clue, it, it existed at all. And I remember driving through and thinking like, huh, I, I wonder why people are out here and what they do for a living and all that. And then I just kept driving to L.A. Uh, and thought nothing of it. And here I am. It's like a goddamn black hole. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of parts of California that even native Californians don't know exist until we're forced to, you know, experience them more, or, you know, we, or we, we get to experience them, if you want to put it that way. Here's a study, looking at this, this is from the Sacramento Bee newspaper up 
north in Sacramento. Um, so this question, where does NorCal begin? And what I love about this is so Redding, which is up here, these guys are hardcore where they're saying Sacramento is Southern California, which is awesome. San Francisco, Southern California, Lake Tahoe, Southern California. Whereas if you live in Merced, you're like, well, we're Northern California, right? And that's the thing. Like everybody up here, you're like, well, I'm, I'm Northern Californian, but those other people below me, uh, I don't know about it, right? Like they're, everybody's on the frontier, the border right there. But so you can see it shifts. And everybody always agrees. Like LA, the city, that belongs. San Diego, that belongs. But uh, yeah, nobody really knows. That's, that's a vernacular region. All right. Hopefully that, that makes sense. That the difference, but just go over these distinctions between those different types of region. All right. And number three, we have diffusion, and this is the idea of culture spreading, right? And, and I have this question, does culture spread? Of course it does, right? Says the guy speaking English uh, in, you know, what is known today as Southern California, right? This isn't, you know, English didn't start here in this, this part of the world. I hate to break it to you, um, but that's an example of culture spreading, right? The language is spoken and where they're spoken and, and all of that, right? So clearly it spreads. Then the question is, okay, well, how? How does it spread? Um, so this, I think Steve brings up uh, Tobler here in his uh, his book. I, just, I like the guy because he, I think he looks like a James Bond villain uh, in this this photo here. Uh, and, and his first law of geography is Everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. Huh. It's interesting. It's a, an idea. Well, I mean, my God, it's not just an idea. It's a law, right? It's the law. And um, I mean, this was a law. You can still call it a law. Um, this, hey, hey, this worked. 50 years ago, no problem. I don't know about today. I don't know what, uh, you know, we would have a discussion again in class and we could actually see each other and, and all that. Um, but you know, is this, I'll just, I tell you what, here's what I'll do. I'll just, I'll just pose this question to you so you can think about it. And you, you know, you don't talk to me about it or whatever. It's just, it's a way for me not to have to ramble on about it. And you can think about it if you want and we can move on. But I'll just say, uh, does this make sense in, in the 21st century? Oh, oh, maybe, maybe not. All right, moving on. It's just it's something to think about, right? Um, but still, we'll see how it still can play a big role. Scale plays a big part there. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss it. Um, okay, but so with diffusion, culture has to start somewhere, right? Or a cultural thing or, you know, practice, belief, object, bit of technology, tool, like whatever it might be. It's got to start somewhere with some group of people. And so we have what's called independent invention, which describes when some group of people invent some new cultural thing. And we know it doesn't, uh, one cool thing about humanity, and, and there's a, you know, there's, there's always discussion about, you know, where does the biology end and culture begin and, and all of that. There's no good answer. Nobody knows, really. We argue uh, about this stuff. Um, what I think is cool, if we go back far enough into the archaeological record, we see that there's stuff that just, it's invented by humans around the world, clearly independently. You know, one group didn't influence another group because they were separated by oceans and there's no evidence of, of uh, people meeting and interacting and all that. But we have stuff that, it's still the same idea, like writing, right? We have different cultures who've developed systems of writing all for the same purpose, to, you know, document stuff, to record things right but they're so 
different. And that's that's going to happen one of the ways in which we know that it's not the result of diffusion. One group comes up with it and they share it with another group or whatever because it's just so crazy different, right? Like, you know, the Roman alphabet, what we're, you know, looking at, which we use here, our, our alphabet that we use, that looks one way. And that makes perfect sense, right? That's clearly the best way because that's what we're used to. That's what we're born into for, you know, I'm assuming um, that's what you were born into. But, you know, if you are of East Asian descent, maybe you're actually used to, you know, Chinese characters or, or you know, some derivation from there, um, but a very different look, right? With the brush strokes and the different symbols and, and all of that. It's still writing, still, you know, gets the job done, does the same thing, but invented independently of this alphabet we're looking at. And then we've got stuff like Mayan glyphs, um, you know, the, the head right here carved into stone, very different. Uh, the Incan Kipu is this, uh, it's knots, um, these, these cords that are knotted. And this, this is writing, right, for the, the, the Inca, for the Incan Empire. Um, I can't read it. I don't know. It, it looks like a cool belt uh, or necklace or, or whatever to me. But that says something to the people who could read it. Right, so it says what what this shows us is that stuff gets invented, and quite often you have the same kind of thing invented, but it's radically different because humans, for all our similarities, and for like we had needs to develop writing at different parts of the world at, at different times, but you know, many many years ago, um, we're, we're similar and we're different at the same time. Right, that's that's the idea. And we describe, we use, it's a cultural hearth. Whenever we point to some, uh, um, you know, place uh, where this stuff is developed, where it's invented, right? So that's, that's what we're looking at. But then from there, we're going to have some diffusion, right? People are going to talk to other people. They're going to meet other people. They're going to chat about stuff and, and move on. Um, and so that's really what diffusion is, how we take this one cultural thing, an idea, an object, whatever, and we're going to share it with somebody else, right? Or it's going to move across space. Might be a better way to think about it, and I'll, I'll explain why in a bit. Um, used to be very slow. It can be instant today, and that's why I question that first law of geography, just, you know, is it really the law in the way today? YouTube, the internet in general. It's, I mean, just, how, you know, teaching another group. Now, YouTube is the best, right? I mean, hell, that's what we're actually, I just realized, this is what we're doing right now, right? I'm talking into the computer, and then I'm just going to magically turn this into to YouTube knowledge, and then you're going to take that YouTube knowledge, and you're going to become geographers from it. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. And it's, it's effectively instant um, as we, we do it, right? So, so again, something to think about. But that's what diffusion is. How these cultural things move from one place to another. And so we've got two primary types of diffusion. Remember, very easy to test on this stuff. So, you know, learn these definitions, have good notes. But we've got relocation and then expansion. And it's pretty straightforward. These aren't like tricky names or whatever. It was with relocation, diffusion, it's where one group relocates from one place to another, right? And of course they bring their culture with them. If I decided that America was not working out for me, for whatever reason, um, you know, and I said, okay, I, am, I shall move. I'm going to move to wherever, to Mongolia. That is where I'm going. Uh, I'm going uh, to get a plane ticket, uh, and I'm going to move. I'm not going to take the family. You know what? I'm going to have a total fresh start. Leave them here. They'll be fine. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly to Mongolia. That's where I'm going to be. I'm bringing my culture with me, right? I'm not going to be one of, like, I could be one of those people who's like, you know, I'm, I'm ready to uh, cast off my 
American culture and just immerse myself in the culture of the Mongolian people and I will be fully Mongolian. No, no. I can learn the language, the customs, I can learn to ride a horse, um, you know, whatever I need to do to, to fit in, to assimilate, but I'm still bringing my culture with me, right? And so that's what relocation to fusion is all about. And from the European tradition, we see this a lot, like this little thing here. It's the idea that, uh, you know, everybody is over here. Uh, is, is one culture. We, you know, we take all our, you know, the story of America. How we had the pilgrims, right? Some British folk who were hanging out over here, and then they, uh, or I guess, oh, actually, I'm doing the uh, English folk. I guess would be the the proper term. Um, so they hang in the air, and they're like, "You guys are being dicks," uh, and they get in a boat, uh, and they they sail over, and they come over to the New World, and and so it's diffusion. In the sense that you know it's it moved across space, but they didn't, it wouldn't increase you know, participants of this culture of this you know English culture of the Puritan culture like whatever right it's simply people are moving that's what relocation diffusion is now expansion diffusion is where yeah stuff is going to move across space, but we're also going to see that the 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 participants in this cultural stuff, the speakers of a language, the practicers of a religion, people who use a certain technology or whatever, those numbers are going to grow, right? The culture is going to expand in terms of how many people are a part of that culture. And within that expansion diffusion, we have three subtypes, hierarchical, contagious, and stimulus diffusion. All right, so we'll, we'll go through these. All right, so hierarchical, so we've got a hierarchy, right? There's some kind of order. There's some kind of status in place. So an idea or whatever, it goes from one group to another group, but there's that status in place. So traditionally, with hierarchical diffusion, you've got it goes from one group to the elite group, the people with that high status, high class kind of stuff, and then it filters down to the other groups until eventually it might go to those people with the lowest status or whatever, but it clearly goes through this order, okay? And so it's an idea, typically we see like it, it's the big city is where this idea starts, and then it kind of filters out to the suburbs, and then eventually it'll get to the, the rural areas and, and all that. Sushi is a way we typically explain this. That, you know, the idea of sushi, from an American standpoint, I should say, um, that's crazy, right? Like, you're Japanese, no big deal. Um, but for an American, prior to, you know, the 1980s, the idea of eating raw fish on some rice and seaweed... I mean, that sounded like a dare, right? That sounded like, that's disgusting. Who would do that? You would die, I think. If you did that, you got to cook the stuff. That's not, that's not healthy. Um, but we have, I, I'm pretty sure it started in L.A. Uh, from Japanese immigrants. So, there, you know, so there's some relocation diffusion kind of starting it. But the way we get sushi as it is in the American sense today starts in L.A. with hip elite people. It's cool. It's what wealthy people do. They eat the raw fish and the seaweed and all that. And then the people, you know, in the suburbs, they see this and they're like, what? Look at the eating the raw fish. And they didn't die. God, they look cool. Right? And so they want to be like the cool, hip, elite Angelinos, the, the wealthy movie producers or whoever, you know, eating the, the sushi. And some people from like Burbank start to eat it. And we start to see sushi restaurants kind of open up in some of these outer areas. And then... You know, the real hillbillies, us, uh, the, like the Antelope Valley people are like, what? They were raw fish. What? And, and but, but they're doing it. And we're like, you know, well, Burbank, that's, I mean, the coolest, right? Um, well, we don't even know about hip actual LA. We think Ikea is the pinnacle. Uh, and so we see people eating, uh, um, you know, that, right? We're cool. And now you can get it everywhere, right? But it had to filter that way. Then I'm sure, I don't know this for a fact. 
<laughs> but uh, I'd bet money on it. I, I bet you could find sushi in like a Little Rock gas station. I'll bet you. You shouldn't eat it at all, uh, right? But but still, I bet you can find it because it's it's diffused. It's kind of it's nothing special, right? Anymore. That's the hierarchical diffusion. And then the the example of Walmart and hip hop um, down there. That's what we call reverse hierarchical, meaning that it actually starts with that lower status, and then works its way up. So the idea that Walmart's traditionally they started in rural areas and then they tried to move into cities that was their approach to expansion uh yeah but we'll talk about the history of that but it's the idea it starts in the south bronx in new york in the 70s just like the the poorest most neglected area um that's where it starts and then it it moves up until you know rich kids um you know love this stuff right that's that's the idea. So it's reverse hierarchical when it goes from the bottom, that lower status, up to the elite group or that, that high status. All right? So that's hierarchical. There's an, there's an order. Now, contagious, um, that's, that's, that's totally different. It doesn't care what, uh, you know, what status you have. Um, you know, it just, it spreads. And... It's the idea, like we discuss contagious disease. We should be careful with that, though. Like, and I, I nearly made some coronavirus comment here, but but then I stopped um, because no, because it's the thing. Like, okay, yeah, or, or no, yeah, okay. This is what happens when it gets late at night, and I'm just. I'm thinking, um, but no, it's the idea that, so let's say I got, I got me the COVID, right? I, I got it. And I demand like, you know what? I missed the classroom and I want to bring you guys in to the classroom because, because God, I miss you and I'm asymptomatic and I know I feel fine, a little feverish, but you know, I, I'm sure it's something I ate. It was that sushi, um, or whatever. Right. So we go into the classroom and then I just, I'm just sneezing and 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 lecturing right like just you know spitting all sorts of little covid -y particles out into the classroom and it's getting on you and you're all going to have covid too and you know voila that's how pandemic starts right we we think of like the disease doesn't care who you are okay that's the idea here that you know an immune system is an immune system we're just a host for a virus or whatever but this is a materialist thing at work here we also want to be aware like if you look at the breakdown of who's getting COVID-19, who's getting this particular coronavirus, who's coming down with it, is it just completely diverse? No. No, we're seeing that people of color and poor people are, are suffering more from this, right? So clearly, status plays a role even if that's not part of the biology, but think about that. Like, why is that? Is it a biological thing? Is it just that, like, you know, uh, Hispanic people are, are more susceptible, right? Or, or black people are, or whatever. And, like, you know, white folk just, uh, they got good, good, good genes. That's why, you know, that's why I got all the money and all the power, right? Because of the good genes. Parody, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm joking about that. Although, when I get to race, we'll see that some people truly believe that. Um, even today, but no, clearly it's because like, you know, because of race, that's how a lot of status stuff has, has happened in this country. So you're actually more likely to get this stuff if you're in a job or you're one of these, you know, frontline workers or essential workers, which is a way of trying to make people who make very little money and have just shitty jobs feel better uh, about the fact that we need them to go to work and get sick so we can sit back in our nice homes and Talking to our computers at our desk and still cash a paycheck. And yeah, again, I'm part of the problem. But but you get what I'm saying, right? So contagious means it's like a contagious disease, like a virus. But even then, question status and hierarchy and wealth and core periphery and, and all of that. Okay, all right. Yeah, that was, all I did was made you more confused. Okay. Stimulus diffusion. Let's move on um, to this, this final type here. So this is where you got a cultural practice 
that's taken from one place to another, right? It goes from one group to a new group, but it's not directly copied because it can't be for whatever reason. Right? One example uh, that was used in, in another book is a classic example. Uh, I don't know if Steve references this or not. I can't remember. Um, but it's the idea of raising cattle or livestock in Europe fantastic right which wasn't actually a europe thing it started in in mesopotamia it started, it started in the levant you know we typically call the middle east today um but it goes into europe and everybody loves it. like oh man who wants to go hunt some wild cow or whatever where you just keep your cows there and when you're hungry you punch one of them and you eat them there fantastic and this is the idea it, it's brought to siberia and the siberians are like hey that is cool but the problem was cows couldn't live up there. They'd fall over dead because it's too cold. Um, so the Siberians said, okay, we're going to do the same idea, but we're going to use reindeer, right? Stand as little helpers. Um, we're going to, yeah, see, that's that's the thing. Like, we're okay with cows. Cows uh, deserve to be eaten. But uh, but reindeer, my God, think of the presents and the children, right? Uh, but no, it was just reindeer are just cows of the north. That's That's effectively what it is. So they did the same idea of domesticating big delicious animals keeping them in an area when they're hungry kill them and eat them but they changed it to a new animal a different animal that they would you know was wild and they would domesticate um because they could actually survive in the cold right so that's stimulus diffusion so same general idea it's brought to a new group a new group of people it's still an expansion idea but it's changed based on some kind of physical you know, characteristic of the place, like in the case of weather, uh, or it could be cultural stuff. Maybe, you know, this idea works, but it's changed for, like, religious purposes. Like the idea of search engines, when you get into a place like the Middle East and the Muslim countries, sometimes that changes, right? So it's not exactly Google. It's a, a type, it's like a, it's a Google-like thing, but it's one that fits the Muslim religion and the idea of modesty and, and things like that, right? So that's what stimulus diffusion is. No, I'm, I'm no, I'm not going to talk about it. It's, uh, no, all right, let's skip that. Um, it's worth mentioning that ideas just don't travel, right? We have what are called absorbing barriers, where typically it's, we see it with governments, it can also be kind of a more social, cultural vibe. Um, it, but, but typically with governments, they can say, no. We, we saw this in the West here. Remember, it was the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing, um, you know, in China. Uh, they, it was a case like journalists over here. We're shocked by the censorship by the state government. What could be said? What couldn't be said? What could be broadcast and, and all that? You know, that's the, the idea. Um, but with a lot of these, stuff changes. It, because you know, it's cultural. People change. People how they change their minds. Or one generation dies and a new one shows up. And, you know, stuff changes. Well, that's all we need to say on that. All right. So, number four. We're getting there, people. The fourth uh, core concept of... Uh, human geography or cultural geography here is process and pattern. And we'll see examples of this. Like when I talk about mapping specifically, we'll look at some crime data, discuss some of this stuff. But it's, again, it's this idea of it's not just, you know, what it is, uh, but it's where it is. And not just like the where, like we point to one spot on the map, but we're looking like is, is other stuff like this happening you know in some place like to go back to crime data if we're looking at all the crimes that took place within a specific year well we want to map those we want to know exactly where this one crime took place but at the same time you know what other crimes took place did they all happen in one area were they clustered right which we see on the the left here indicating that they're happening around something, right? In a certain area for whatever reason. And we might not know what that is right off the bat. It might take us a while to figure that out, but we can at least 
we can start to ask the questions, right? We can get into the why, right? Like maybe there's something causing this crime to happen, right? That, that we're not even thinking about. But if we map this stuff and we look at it, we can figure it out and go, ho, ho, right? That, that, this is why. Like there was Lancaster uh, a while ago now. They, like, they started shutting down massage parlors, right? You know what I mean, massage parlors. They go, yeah, it's not just because your shoulders are tight. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, they're doing naughty stuff in there. Uh, and so the city of Lancaster said, yeah, we're going to shut them down. That's why there's so much crime in Lancaster. And I had a student, and I'm going to keep this very anonymous because she didn't want me to say it. Um, she wanted to leave because of where she worked and all that stuff. But she did a study when this was happening. Uh, in a GIS class that we had, where she looked at crime around massage parlors, uh, and then she looked at it around donut shops. as a little like, how you doing, fellas? To the cops. Uh, right there. But just, you know, seeing if it held true, and it was actually, there was more crime, from what I remember, taking place around the donut shops than these massage parlors. Um, but of course, you know, like, massage parlors were easy to blame you can point and go ah, prostitutes and you know and the, the idea of, of also you know asians and, and and all that stuff really easy to point fingers at when you actually mapped it no they weren't causing there was no clustering uh, around there that was not the case at all right so that's that's what cluster refers to whereas random would mean that no there's no pattern at all right and that's that's where typically when you see something is random that's where our geography powers are rendered useless. That's our kryptonite right there. Um, you know, because it's when we when we have those patterns like that it's clustered, oh, that's where we can start to work our, our magic. But random, it's effectively, it's kind of saying like, yeah, place doesn't matter, right? Or at least it doesn't in the way we're thinking of. Maybe it always matters, but, but not quite the same way. And then dispersed means that it's spread out but done so with a specific pattern, right? Again, there's that pattern to the phenomena, whatever it is we're studying. Okay, so we we uh, we yeah we want to look at we want to map the big picture quite a bit. So that's what process and pattern means. Mapping this stuff oh, it can explain so much. Uh, and we'll, oh, I'm tired. We'll we'll skip um, this. Uh, but this term. Spatial autocorrelation, uh, it's useful to know. It's, kind of, it's connected to Toler's law that we were talking about. So it's the idea, oh, I'll read this, this thing here. A measure of the degree to which a set of spatial features tend to be clustered together in space, meaning positive, or dispersed, negative. And it's effectively saying if something has this positive autocorrelation, it means that stuff that's closer together is more connected than stuff that's further apart, right? That's the, the idea. So when we see that clustering, we're, we're going off of that first law, um, you know, in there to say that things that are closer together are going to be more connected, right? So it's a way to study this stuff. But again, my question posed to you does it still really work? Like, if we could look at stuff with the internet and all that today, it might actually appear random, but maybe it isn't. Maybe we're just not looking at the right connections. We're looking at a traditional map, but it's actually, it's computer networks. It's cyberspace. It's that kind of stuff. It's actually connected, and that way it's clustered around something that we can't even see. Oh, oh. see what I did there? I defeated my kryptonite. Yeah, maybe it's we're just not asking the right questions. We're getting the right data or whatever. That's the good stuff, right? And that's when you, oh, when you do something like that, when you're like, oh, it's this. It's the greatest feeling in the world, right? Like you you college kids with your drugs and, and all that. Oh, say no to drugs, pass on grass. And say, you know what's, you know what's, you know what's the greatest high? Kids, it's, uh, it's just when you, yeah, you, you figure something out in some nerdy science geography study. It's true. Jay, sign up today for more classes. I'll show you. All right, so that's okay. So that's the whole process and pattern thing. And then finally, co location. This is where we're, we're looking at 
not just, you know, one type of thing like crimes in an area, but where we're looking at, you know, maybe crimes and something else. Like Steve's example here, uh, I've got maps on the left and the green, apologies if you're colorblind, um, but the one on the left, uh, it represents income inequality. And then on the right, it's murder rate, right? So we're looking at crimes, yeah, like, yeah, who's killing whom and all that, but it's com connecting it to, um, you know, the idea of income inequality. Poor folks and rich folks, how many people are living beneath the poverty line and all that, okay? And so it gets into what we're looking for and what he's, what he's showing here. It's, it's not like a perfect causal relationship, okay? And the idea that, you know, it will happen. You're going to have murders galore in a place where, where this isn't, uh, uh, you know, where you've got this income inequality, right? Now, correlation, let's get into, there's, there's a statistical relationship. Doesn't mean A is going to get you B every single time, maybe, but A is definitely connected to B, right? And it's something to study. And then spurious would mean it's a coincidence. There's no actual connection whatsoever. And this is a very powerful thing to be able to do. You don't have to just be a positivist to get excited about this stuff, but to be able to look at what's happening where and this other stuff and where that's happening and compare it and see, is there, is there a connection here? Or no, it's just a coincidence. And we'll see, again, I keep bringing up race. Uh, I feel like ooh, with this over and over, but that's, that's where we'll see it. Because a lot of people who are invested in race and racism and, and actually this idea that people of different races are truly different, they're invested in taking these spurious connections and trying to make them look causal, right? Trying to make it look like, oh, it's because they look like that. It's because it's those people. But when you really actually do the mapping, you know, when you actually study this stuff, you go, oh, no, 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 spurious. That doesn't make any sense at all, right? But you got to do the work to figure that out, and we'll, we'll look at some of that. All right, so those are our core concepts, and the whole idea is that we're, you know, we're, we're using all this stuff to try to get at a whole host of things. You know, we're interested in facts. Oh, that's a tricky word. We like concepts. That's a word I like more. Concept is less, you know, cut and dry than facts. Ideologies, we'll talk about that. Uh, and then, you know, truth. Some some people, you know, feel there is a truth out there to find. Others, like myself, would say that's a stupid word. Even though I'm, I probably already used it, you know, in this lecture. It, it's, it's habit. Um, but we're interested in all this stuff. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use tools that have been introduced. And, and these concepts like, you know, regions and diffusion and co-location and all that stuff. To just try to get answers of some kind. Whether it's we're trying to find actual truth or just some facts, or get to the ideological reasons why some people are the way they are and all that. This is what we're doing, okay? So hopefully, you guys are set. In fact, like now, my little baby birds, we are ready to spread our wings, right? And do some actual hardcore geography. So next time, what we're gonna get into, we're gonna talk culture, and we're gonna talk difference, and we're gonna look at real stuff, and like, we're gonna talk cigarettes, Mm, more delicious cigarettes. Yeah, we'll get into why smoking is so cool and makes you want to be a cowboy, right? Amongst other things. So until then, you know, smoke them if you got them uh, and, and enjoy and, uh, and I'll be back and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, all right. Talk to you later.